Kentucky. Um, long time. Oh. I think he'll introduce himself as well. Uh, my name is Paul Yerofti, and today I want to talk about the work I did on the Oction machines. Um, I want to take you through the drivers and the obstacles that I faced uh, during the last year, or maybe year and a half now. And uh, I'm going to wrap it up uh, with um, what's coming to the OpenBSD port. Um, who am I? I'm a reverse engineer. I uh, work for six years now in the antivirus in industry. I designed an emulator for antiviruses. Um, and I also wrote different static and uh, dynamic engines. I'm also an OpenBSD hacker since um, 2008, I think. Uh, and I didn't really find a single spot on which to focus on OpenBSD. Uh, so I started with, with uh, really easy stuff like ACPI and power management. Coming from a reverse engineering background, it looked appealing. Little did I know, though. Uh, and then I moved to uh, Lungson, which is a MIP64 machine that the Chinese produce. And it's supposed to be entirely open source and as far as hardware goes, but of course it's not because uh, there's one piece there, which is called the embedded controller, which does just that, embeds all the control in a single chip of the entire machine, and it's not documented. So that was supposed to be fun, ended up not being so much fun, but at the end of the road, you say, yeah, I did that, it was nice, so it was fulfilling in the end. And because of that, um, I got to see how a MIP64 machine works. Uh, I moved on to Oction later on, but in the meantime, I also do Compat Linux support for OpenBSD because, um, well, when I first started working at Bitdefender, um, I went to use OpenBSD and uh, IDA, which is a reverse engineering tool, was working on OpenBSD. So um, I used, they have, they have a port for Linux, so I used Compat Linux for that. And it used to work. I haven't, I'm, I haven't used it for a few years now. I don't know if recent versions work, but they should. And also, I port miscellaneous uh, applications uh, to OpenBSD, which is the most fun thing to do because it's a lot easier than the rest. And you actually get to see things working, not just panics and blue messages popping at you. And if that wasn't enough, I'm also following a PhD uh, in uh, a very, uh, connect, very well connected subject of uh, parallel computing on the GPUs, which has nothing to do with anything so far. But it's very interesting as well. I do signal processing and um, I'm about to finish my PhD. I, I have some courses on parallel programming at the Faculty of uh, Computer Science in Bucharest. So that's about it. Once a year I go out and have fun. Uh, how did I get in touch with Oction? It was almost random. Um, as I said, I played with other MIP64 ports. I tried SGI for a bit, but I couldn't get it working, the model I had, and Miod finally did that for me, so it wasn't interesting anymore. Uh, but then um, I had a first contact with Oction during the Toronto hackathon, which, is, um, which uh, was a very good hackathon for me, but had nothing to do with Oction besides the fact that I sit next to Jasper, who was hacking on this small box, always mumbling stuff in uh, Dutch. Yes, thank you. I was Netherlandese? Mm, no, Dutch, thanks. And uh, I like when I see people angry because I can, uh, I can understand that and I can relate to that. So I kept asking him what's going on and he was working on a bootloader for this Oction machine. And it was really interesting. I I was mostly looking at his console output and following my work for a few days, but uh, that got me interested. And I wrote a small phrase in the Undeadly report, which is the OpenBSD journal, 
um, about this experience. And Diana, which was kind enough to write me an email right away, so do you want one or what? And I was like, oh, well, okay, I didn't even think about that. I was just telling a story about the hackathon. And soon enough, I got a DSR 500 machine, which is a D-Link uh, router switch uh, that's based on Oction. And that's how the nightmare started. Because I was looking forward to this, and um, the first thing to do when you get a box is open it and then st try to boot whatever is in there. But of course, it was running U-Boot, which is very popular with ARM people. And you can see that because U-Boot has a thousand variations, just like ARMs. So there's no coherency. You can't read a single document and see how you're able to program that. So I was lucky enough to learn how to boot a kernel through other people's work and hair loss, since I have enough hair now. Uh, but Miod was not so lucky, and he wrote most of the instructions uh, that don't really make sense. Typing boot Oction Linux dash BSD is uh, kind of schizophrenic. But anyway, once I got through that, I managed to go all the way through the copyright, and then the kernel crashed, which was awesome. Actually, I'm really excited when I see that because I get to fix things and I get to, I get to uh, talk about things and visit nice places like Bulgaria and meet you guys. So I knew this was coming when I saw that crash. <laughs> so I, looking at getting past the copyright, which is not so interesting, uh, I had to look at how the Akian memory is organized. And it's split into chunks. You don't really expect to have a lot of memory on an Oction machine. So you have different um, chunks of um, um, buffers that memory gets mapped onto. So um, as you can see, you got the first uh, range, which is the first 20, 256 meg, the second range. And then what, whatever else is above 512 gets mapped in the last section. But my DSR 500 had 128 meg, and nobody expected that, because we're in 2010 plus. And it was a small system memory, and the code, the kernel, assumed that it sh uh, the memory should at least have 256 meg. And it was doing this um, substitution, this, uh, this subtraction here which, of course, ended up with me having terabytes or petabytes of RAM because it overflowed. So fixing that, I got a big reward, but I was a bit scared because I got all the way to user land. So there was nothing to fix. So we we're three slides in. I couldn't present something with only three slides. So, but I was kind of happy. And I started looking at the D message for more problems, and there were plenty. Even though the D message is really short, if you're used to AMD 64 D messages, which take like 10 pages, this was like a s less than a screen, which is very nice uh, because you can see it all at once. So, first of all, Oct CF is short for Oction Compact Flash, which is not configured, so no internal memory. Awesome. This memory address conflict coming from a, the PCI address space, which I still haven't fixed today. Um, and then there's the PHY to which the network was connecting to, uh, the network uh, adapter was connecting to, and uh, that, that means unknown PHY. So there were some problems there. So I was kind of starting to uh, get a bit excited about the machine again. And also, there was no symbol table. What that means is that when you get a crash, you only get hexadecimal output on your screen. No symbols. That means no, no, no trace, no parsable trace. Once you start reading in hexadecimal, um, Cyrillic seems fun. Um, so where to from here? I, I wanted to add more drivers, which I did, and I'm going to talk later on. I wanted storage support and networking, of course. The, these things seem important for a port. And I especially wanted to help Jasper 
to improve the second stage bootloader in order to get the symbols and make my life easier, which didn't happen until today. Uh, but I, we worked on the bootloader this year in the summer in the hackathon in Ljubljana in Slovenia, and it's getting there. So the end goal being we should have a port that's able to stand on its own, and uh, the users, which I hope to be amongst, uh, should be able to just create a cheap router or switch out of the Octeon and get the sweet OpenBSDD message from it. So then I, when looking at drivers and implementing them, I, I had got my first major disappointment, which is the SDK license that comes from the KVM people, the guys that produce Octeons. And they were very nice to open source all their SDK for the drivers, so you only need to call a few functions and hook them up to your kernel. But the problem is that they have this, it's almost like a BSD license, except for the US export uh, clause, which uh, we don't use in the project. I don't want to get into politics because I don't understand them really. But since the project decided that, and I kind of agree with it, we need to be coherent, we have no such license in the tree, I couldn't use it. So um, I mailed the guys, I sent an email, I got uh, a lot of replies uh, towards zero. Uh, I, the, the weird thing is that the SDK covers USB, uh, random number generator, uh, I don't know, network card, everything, every driver. And they also have a crypto accelerator, which I'm guessing it's why that clause is there. And I asked them if they can just resume that clause to the crypto accelerator that they have on the chip. But I got no answer. Because I think that's why that got there, and then it was just copied over and over. So I wanted to start with a simple driver, because uh, I wanted to see how um, the registers look and how how I um, could use the Octeon without the SDK. So I wanted to start with a random number generator, which should have been pretty easy, because uh, I just need to start it, get the output, and fit it to our random number subsystem. Um, so I started looking at the magical figures that the SDK is using for the control register for the random numbers. And it's as easy as I expected. You just uh, read the control register, make sure you set up the output, you set the output at the entropy flag, and just after you write it back, you should get randomness from there on. So you just do this once during boot. So the numbers are written in the entropy register, which is different from the control one. You fit it to uh, our API for randomness, and then you keep reading every 10 milliseconds. Easy. The obstacles I faced, this was actually the driver that took uh, most of my time, I think, uh, was because of endianness. So the, <laughs> the register addresses are written in a different endian in, in uh, the SDK than in than what you're supposed to fit there, to, to fit to the uh, control register. So if you want to um, do an actual read and access a register, you're supposed to flip all the bits, because that's why. I don't know why. <laughs> so uh, besides that, there was a read after write required whenever you set the control register, just to make sure it was actually written there, which is not uncommon, but still, for something as simple as that, I didn't expect. And another, when I finally got the driver, I was feeding eight bytes of data, but I was uh, told that only four are needed to be fed to the random subsystem, which you can ask Theo why tomorrow during his talk. Moving on, I, I, I got a message every time I did NFS boot, which is really annoying because it's in caps, and uh, you know, IRC culture, you get uh, bleeding eyes when you see caps. So I want to get rid of that. So because we didn't have a clock, we only used the file system to get the time of day clock. And the Octeon boards have some 
really good clocks. I mean, the Swiss must be proud of this technology of clocks of a one second resolution. I mean, they're awesome. And they're the ones that are used to get time and set time for the time of day clock. Uh, if that wasn't scary enough, in order to get to the clock, you need to use a two-wire serial, serial interface, which is a twisted way of uh, getting across to different devices. So you get stuff like um, an internal address of that uh, serial interface. And you get uh, nice things like um, a read bit, which needs to be checked if the serial interface actually read what you told it to read and all kinds, the valid bit, it's, it's very stable and robust. And you get like all this 32-bit metadata just to write 32 bits, which in the case of the RTC clock is even less. But sure, uh, it's supposed to be like this. So you set the address field for the real-time clock device, and afterwards you just use internal addresses. You don't uh, use the entire address to access the time clock. And you set the operation of reading or writing uh, in the metadata that I showed. And you just do reads and writes from the data field. That should be easy. I don't know why I'm complaining so much. Well, maybe because you do it in two steps. The first being that you need to set the read bit in order to read something from the, from the RTC clock. And then you need to set the valid bit. This is done in sequence, of course. Um, and um, you need to write to the register, which is like controlling the entire interface and telling you what, what to do. But the second step, you need to read back and keep reading back until the valid bit is set. And if that is cleared, then the operation was done. And you can get a byte of data. Awesome which is one second resolution. So you have enough time, enough time to loop. So, yeah. Um, and the writes are done in a similar fashion in that you set bits in order to write and you finally, con you finally configure that register for a write and then the second step reads back what, uh, if the operation was completed and loops all over except with the extra bit of having to read back even after you got the valid, the OK. I, I wrote there, you still have to do an extra read. <laughs> so afterwards, you get useful information. Uh, everything is uh, BCD coded, um, which, yes, it's uh, good, I guess. Uh, and you get to feed the set time and get time routines, um, the BCD formatted data. So that got me to a real time clock. But of course, the issues, if it wasn't obvious so far, is that it's very fragile. You need to read. There, there are a lot, if you're looking at the code, if you have nothing better to do, uh, there are a lot of checks, integrity checks there. Uh, because of the loops, and uh, it can actually even time out, I think. Uh, it's, it's complicated. And some models don't even have a real-time clock. So uh, the f uh, when I committed it, I, expect I expected everyone to have a real-time clock, but some just panicked because there was nothing there when you tried to read or write to that real-time clock, like the Ubiquiti uh, edge router. So buy that. Uh, moving on. I was able to NFS boot um, without the caps. But you know, in order to NFS boot, uh, first I had to TFTP boot. All of these involve a network, which was working until I reached user land, when I couldn't even ping. I couldn't do anything. Uh, I, I didn't get media, and uh, the status was uh, no carrier. So it, it was like no cable connected. But that far, it could reach the network. So I wanted to fix that, of course. Looking at the missing phi for the Broadcom uh, device there. Um, remember the unknown phi message from the D message that I talked 
uh, in the beginning, I started looking at other people's work, which, which is what I mostly do because I don't really like to work. I like to get other people's work and adapt it and call it mine. So OpenWRT had a wonderful um, driver for it, with it which I uh, adapted and trimmed down uh, for different reasons. Um, I basically just got the values that I need to read and uh, read from uh, the, med the media information uh, because the OpenWRT driver was a lot more complex and was doing a lot more things like uh, switching, which we don't have support for in OpenBSD uh, for you know doing multiple port switch and uh, uh, um, like uh, the Z router project from FreeBSD and stuff like that. Uh, so I wrote a minimal driver which does uh, dumb mode switching. So whatever you plug in there, uh, it sends, sends out. So I need to get to, to the status of, of the file to see if the link state is uh, OK, if, uh, what kind of mode we're in, and what the speed is. So this was done through registers from the read from the status page of the file. So in order to get that, I need to make sure that I'm on the right page. And of course, you need an extra readback operation even after you, after you set the page that you want to be in. And then once you're in the right page, you get the uh, data from there on, in two bytes of data that tell you uh, what the CPU uh, port is doing. So what media it has, uh, the link state and everything. And the next for the next ports, you get the inflow in the uh, second, third, and fourth data registers. My DSR for uh, 500 has four ports, so that's why. So after that, I got media uh, right here. And I could ping. So network was working, which is really nice to have on a router. So for the switch support, I was planning on integrating uh, one of the two frameworks, the Z router one, which I am more familiar with because I, I'm, I was in contact a lot of, for a lot of time with Alexander. And there is also the IIJ solution, the IIJ people from uh, Japan. Um, they ha have a commercial support for the Octeon based on OpenBSD, and they open sourced a solution for the switch framework, uh, which I tried to uh, integrate into OpenBSD during the Ljubljana hackathon this summer, but um, the guy developing that was very busy and um, didn't have, we couldn't sync in order to um, discuss integrating it. Moving on, the hardest part is the USB support because the compact flash, even if you, even, even if you have a driver for it, it's like 32 meg. So the Z router people are stripping down FreeBSD in order to fit in that compact flash. And then they have USB support for the KVM SDK, so you can add extra storage. Um, so there's that driver. And then there's the IJ driver, which they also open source, but they only work for the 3000 models of the KVM machines. And um, it's also very specific to, their, uh, to the machine that they sell, and it's not really working on uh, the machines that we support. And then there's my driver, which I finally got to a point where it no longer fries sticks. I managed to fry like four or five memory sticks with it, with a small spark coming out of it when I plugged them in. That was lovely. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about that wonderful implementation I did. Um, I started by doing the machine-specific, the host controller-specific uh, initial initialization uh, routines which is a clock setup, core setup, DMA, and setting up a proper interrupt. And this was uh, pretty much uh, stealing magical uh, values from the SDK or looking at what the IIJ people did. It's always a mix, so I always had like uh, four or five virtual screens with uh, X terms to their code. Um, and once I did that, I managed to get an, an attachment so uh, the Oct Octeon host controller was attaching to USB 0, which uh, I know 
it doesn't sound like much, but to me it was a glorious day. And uh, I even got some error messages, so more work, awesome. So I wanted to fix those. And the first thing was to add an interrupt routine, which is, um, um, it's, it's really easy to start with. You just add bits of pieces there, and, but the memory sticks keep frying whenever you think you were making progress. So uh, the best thing I, I did was uh, look at both implementations and make a co and I was able to make a coherent um, interrupt routine that looks if you open other host control drivers in OpenBSD they're going to look the same and you're going to spot the machine specific bits when looking at the two in parallel so I think that's nice uh, even if I have an accident or whatever uh, MPI can come over and finish the driver for me uh, so oh by the way I never looked at USB before this so um, this was also a very nice experience to uh, start learning about a different uh, layer and um, MPI which is uh, USB master nowadays in OpenBSD was very kind to uh, answer my ridiculous questions so after I, I've, I've, I've uh, finished the interrupt routine or so I thought I keep adding code to it uh, I got a proper D message without those errors that doesn't mean that it was working it just the messages went away so uh, I moved on to uh, um, adding root hub support, which is um, like uh, like the media support for the FI. You you start notifying people about what's happening in your uh, hub, which is um, the status. You get the scripter of uh, the requests that are uh, sent to the hub, um, and um, also fixing the USB 2 descriptors because you have to register the host controller as a USB 2 controller. Fixing those and acknowledging the fact that I was getting commands from outside helped fix the frying problem. So I was able to plug in things without sparks and um, I was able to use the devices afterwards. So this was... I'm not sure if it was progress though because uh, some people offered money for the driver before just to be able to make pranks on 1st of April to people <laughs> and uh, but uh, in my point of view it was progress because now the USB port was doing the same thing as before nothing you plug in a device and you get nothing back you pull it out and it still works so back to uh, base back to the bases um, and then in order to actually get something out of the USB uh, host controller, I started adding uh, more support for USB ports and uh, endpoints. Of course, they call end endpoints channels. That took me a long time to figure out. I was like, channels, what's that? I was asking MPI, do you know a channel definition in the USB specification? No, what's a channel? So that was fun, changing that name. Thank you. So um, these allowed me to keep track of when you connect to a port or when you do a port reset, um, and I was able to send notifications upstream, uh, upstream about what was going on. And this actually moved things further, as now the, nowadays I need to implement um, device uh, transfer and control methods, which in terms of um, uh, the actual devices means that I need to start sending data through, so the control is almost there. Because um, to give a l large picture, I, the green things are things that are done and the blue things is what I'm working on and the red is what's missing. So uh, you might think it's half and half but you're being overly optimistic. It's just so that I can show that I did something. It's, this will take a lot of time and it's very sensible work here but uh, at least it's not destroying devices and it's, um, you're able to actually see how things are moving in a USB stack uh, and not getting panics, just not moving data or <laughs> not detecting uh, the proper the proper events. So this is uh, the point where I where where I am today. Uh, as I was saying, the bus 
the bus methods are done and the hub routines should be okayish now. So I'm moving on to devices. Um, so the major showstoppers, because I'm working on this for a while now, is the SDK, which would have the SDK is like two function calls and you're done. You have a host controller. Nice, right? And uh, um, the fact that the SDK and the IIJ code is very different and they, they actually set registers in a different way and in a different order and it's a lot of guesswork and poking and going back to reverse engineering. And um, uh, USB is really hard. I mean, like the spec is hard enough and doing it without the proper documentation is even harder. And the time requirements are really high and I can't, I'm one of the people that need to focus on a task for at least four hours in order to get something done. I can't just work for an hour in the evening after I'm done with regular work on the USB because I need to get in there and remember where I left off and start thinking about the magical values in this part of the world. So um, progress is slow because of that. Moving on to the flash memory, I started working on that as well as um, time off from the USB layer, um, which is uh, it's supposed to be really easy to implement. Uh, it's a compact flash after, after all. The FreeBSD free has a driver for it that's going through CFI. Um, and I, I want to get the code from there. And I probably will end up doing that. The problem is that um, they, they have a lot of layers that they go through and I just want to get the core of the driver. I'll show in a later slide, I think, the layers that it goes through. Or maybe we can see it here. Yeah, the CFI, it's a CFI D connected to a CFI zero. It's, it's, they support a lot of compact flashes because uh, they respect this uh, specification that Intel, AMD, and other people agreed upon. And it's um, different because, of course, Intel or AMD decided to violate that and do things opposite. So a lot of if thefts. And I haven't, I have never done a, a disk driver. So I discussed with DLG, David, um, about it because he's uh, the authority in this domain. <laughs> and um, I, th the idea is to write a small ATA driver for it. But the problem is that this device is so dumb that it's not using most of the ATA things. So it's, it doesn't do c concurrent commands. It just, there are no port multipliers. It's just so easy that the ATA might be even more complicated than what the FreeBSD people are doing. So um, the, the idea now is to avoid doing something like PCIe, uh, which is uh, very, does a lot of layer violations, and to, to do a standalone driver maybe, because the reads and the writes are done through registers. <laughs> you don't do DMA. It's, so I, I'm still changing the implementation every time I'm going back to it. So I'm, I'm, I haven't settled on a direction. So this is, I, as I was saying, I don't know if I should support the entire CFI specification. This is an extension of it. I don't know if I should add that. Maybe I should start small, I don't know. So uh, progress on this uh, is uh, really slow as well. So to conclude, is um, a lot of work of was put into it, even though it's not so obvious. Uh, the lack of documentation, as always, is slowing things. And the SDK copyright was um, is making things even harder. And uh, I would enjoy to have uh, to get some help in these open problems there. And um, I I will continue working on the port, and I want to complete it as soon as pop possible to make it standalone. The the memory storage being the main problem with it nowadays. So thank you for listening to me and questions.
this uh, thing where you had to loop over the real-time clock just to, to be able mm -hmm. to write one byte and wait for the valid bit to, to change value. How many times do you have to loop over that before it, it actually accepts what you're trying to tell it? I haven't. I, I measured it a few times and it wasn't that bad actually. I mean, uh, it seems that it's rarely occurring, uh, the problem there. You always get it the first time, most of the times. But okay. sometimes you can get like three or four uh, iterations before oh, being able to. There was no, but that's no crazy rare. amounts like 10,000. No, no, no. It's uh, not that bad, but it's, yeah, it's yeah. tricky. Yeah. So I know it's not good, but uh, did you try uh, playing with your SDK to see if it would be easier, actually? Um, I tried to play with the SDK. Um, meaning to integrate it and see yeah. how the USB works. I tried that with FreeBSD, and it works really good, and with the Z router, but not with the actual OpenBSD tree, because it, it's, it's not so easy to integrate the SDK. I mean, it, it needs a bit of work, so I prefer to play with other projects that already did that work and try to, yeah. I'm why well, it can give you some pointers so that you don't have to reverse engineer everything? Yeah, no, I'm 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 looking at the SDK and I'm I'm helping myself there from there with uh, different values and stuff. But the logic, it's really like it's uh, the abstraction they use is very deep. So you have to, in order to read the register, you go through like ten or twelve functions until you actually do the read operation because they call it from different places and different drivers and that makes sense for them so okay. integrating that into OpenBSD would be would take a bit of time and it's not impossible and I know that it won't get committed because of that license of course yeah thanks how finicky is the hardware that you are working with to debug does it have a convenient serial console or yes it has a serial console which is a like serial, not uh, JTAG or whatever. So did, did you, no soldering necessary? No. You okay. just buy it and you plug it in. And it was the, there was a D-Link that you were working with? Yes, D-Link, okay. DSR 500. But I think the others are the same. I'm, I don't remember anyone having to solder a serial, but I might be wrong. Yep. And it actually comes up as a PHY as well, the serial, because you get a, like a network cable on one end and on the other the actual serial cable. It's, yeah, works on the fly. Uh, th that might be a very generic question, but what, I mean, are those devices popular? The D-Link, are there many devices using Octane? Uh, is it yes, popular? Yes, D-Link has a lot of models using that. They even mm -hmm. have wireless. Uh, Mine only has a uh, wired network. Some have wireless. A lot mm -hmm. of people are using it as because it comes with a product. I mean, the dealing I have, I could use it right off because it's, they sell those. It's not like uh, I have to write an email and they send me prototypes. Mm -hmm. it's, so yeah, a lot of people seem to be using that. I, I, I'm not sure if the DSR 500, so to say, but there are a lot of Oction models produced by the D-Link. And not only them, but yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. I think Claudio. So uh, can we use these devices for like firewalls and stuff already, or is it not really good? That's what I want to do. Um, I have a server that's running since 1996 or 1997, and I wanted to, once I got this, I wanted to do the, the PF thing on it. And I, I didn't uh, test with OpenBSD, but FreeBSD works, yeah, sure. Yeah. But they're using the SDK. So I don't know if the PHY needs further work or maybe some, but yeah. Looking at the OpenWRT driver, we have most of the things there. So I, I haven't tested with OpenBSD for like actual performance, but then I only run a home server, so I don't, I'm not the speed junkie. Yep. So yeah. you don't know how fast it is? No, I don't know that. Uh, but you should ask 
JMFU or DLG, I know they, they experimented stuff on them and they're, because they, they're building the infrastructure at the university, mm -hmm. they probably looked at the networking figures. So, yeah. Further questions? We still have time, as far as I can tell. So, uh, well, again, uh, so we, st we stole some of the break time earlier. So, uh, if there are no more questions, I'll just let's say thank you. Thank you.